and then the translation. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Living in this world, we often find ourselves waiting for that something that will change our lives. We find ourselves looking for that peace of mind, that sense of fulfillment. We search in our homes and possessions, our jobs and universities, and our families and friends. We became so lost in the contents of this world that we forget to turn to the source of it all. We forget to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yasmin Mujahid is well known among the Muslim youth for delving into the core of this forgetfulness. She addresses matters of the heart from an Islamic perspective. Through her work, she engages her audience on a personal level to remind us that this world is temporary and that true permanence is only found in one's relationship with the Creator. She reminds us that being Muslim means to completely submit oneself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tonight she will be joining us for an enlightening discussion on reclaiming the heart. Ismi Mujahid received her bachelor degree in psychology and her master's in journalism and mass communications from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. After completing her graduate work, she taught Islamic studies and served as a sister's youth director for the Islamic Society of Milwaukee. She also worked as a writing instructor for Cardinal Sturch University and a staff columnist for the Islam section in, on, of In Focus News. Currently, she, she's an instructor for the New Dawn Institute, a writer for the Huffington Post, and an internationally published author, where she focuses most of, most of her work on spiritual and personal development. Yasmin just launched her new book, Reclaiming Your Heart, which is now, Reclaim Your Heart, which is now available worldwide. Tune in live to Serenity, her show on One Legacy Radio, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern, as she discusses questions on faith, spirituality, and relationships from an Islamic spiritual lens. You can also visit her YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash online and her website www.yasminmujahid.com where you can find a collection of her articles, poetry, and lectures. With no further delay, please help me welcome Yasmin Mujahid. Today I'm going to talk about poverty, but I'm not going to talk about the apparent kind of poverty. You see, before we can begin to talk about any concept, we need a criterion, we need definitions. In speaking about poverty, we need to understand that there is external poverty and there is internal poverty. And one is far more dangerous than the other. Because while one form of poverty determines how we live temporarily, the other form determines how we live eternally. Today I will speak on the latter form. Internal poverty is the poverty of the soul. It describes the unmoved soul. The soul that has been created but has still failed to realize why. It is the soul that lives a purposeless life. The heart that beats but has already died. Because while the body cries and bleeds and feels pain from this material world, the soul is untouched by these things. You see, there's only one thing that can cut or stab or impoverish the soul. There's only one thing that can kill it to deprive it of its only one true need, to be close to its originator, to be near God. 
Spiritual deprivation is the true impoverishment. True poverty is standing poor on the day of judgment. Despite this reality, we continue to live this life, feeding our bodies but starving our souls. The sad irony of this focus is that the body we tend to is only temporary, while the soul that we neglect is eternal. When a body dies, we cry. But the death of the body is not true death. It is only the removing of a shell and the movement from one realm to another truer realm. We weep for the departing bodies, but our hearts are unmoved by those bodies which are alive, but whose hearts and souls have already died because of their alienation from that which gives life, God. What impoverishes and kills the heart? It is allowing the heart to love anything as it should only love God. See, the heart was created with a very particular nature and for a very particular purpose. When you fail to use any created thing for the purpose for which it was created, it breaks, it drowns, it starves, it dies. The heart was created by and for God. The heart was created to know and love God. The heart was created to be given to God, to be filled with God. The heart that is given to or filled by any other thing suffers the most painful impoverishment and death. The human heart is like a boat in the ocean of this dunya. The boat that allows the ocean water to enter breaks and then drowns. The human heart that allows this dunya to enter breaks and then drowns and then becomes owned. Owned by this life. Owned by our gadgets, our Facebook, our jobs, the distractions, the fashion trends, the marketing tools, the money, the power, the status. The heart that is owned by this life is a prisoner of the worst kind. The heart that is owned by any other master than the master of masters is the weakest of all slaves. That is true oppression, true death, true poverty. As human beings, we enslave ourselves to different things. Some of us in here are enslaved to money. Some of us have enslaved our hearts to other people. We love them as we should only love a love. Some of us are enslaved to status or to our careers. I tell you to ask yourself, what do you love most? Most people in this room will say we love God most. We say this with our tongues. We, we say this in our minds. But our hearts and our actions say otherwise. How do you know? Ask yourself, what is your refuge? When you're most broken, where do you go? When you're afraid, where do you hide? When you need, who do you ask? What do you fear most? What do you stay up at night worrying about? Who, what makes you cry most? What do you think about most? What occupies your mind in Salah? Is it really God? Is it really Allah on your mind most? Is it really your fear of standing before him that makes you cry in your bed? No, probably not. It's probably the person who left you, the money you lost, the career you couldn't have, the raise you didn't get. 
What are you afraid of most? Just the thought of losing what thing causes you so much anxiety that you feel it physically? Is it your husband, your wife, your money, your job, your career? Is it your image? Is it your figure? What is it? When you're given a choice, what do you do? When Allah says to dress and act a certain way, and society says the opposite, which do you choose? Who defines beauty for you? Who defines success? When Allah says that interest is haram, but your financial ambitions command otherwise, when society's standards for the size of your house and the brand of your car command otherwise, which do you choose? Who defines richness? Who defines poverty? Which type of poverty are you most afraid of? The truth is, we choose what we love most. When we love money most, that's what we choose. When we love people most, they fill our hearts. We think of them most. Our life loses center. We leave the orbit of the creator and we enter the orbit of the creation, a painful and unstable orbit. In the orbit of the creation, we rise and fall with the wave of the creation, the wave of praise and criticism, our standards for success and failure come from the creation, from society. The standard for richness, the standard for poverty, comes from the creation, from society. But I think in teaching Islam, there's a point where we went wrong. I think somewhere along the line, we turned Islam into a list of do's and don'ts harams and halals. We teach our children about hellfire before they can even say al-Rahman al-Rahim, the most gracious, the most merciful. Sunday school has become a place to teach you all the things that are haram to do and then all the punishments that you'll be dealt if you do them. When someone converts, the first thing they're told is that now they need to change their name and stop celebrating Valentine's Day. Somewhere along the line, I think we started going about Islam from the outside in, instead of from the inside out. But we need to ask ourselves, how did the prophets do it? One of the companions relates that Aisha has said, if the first thing to be revealed was, do not drink alcoholic drinks, people would have said, we will never leave alcoholic drinks. And if it had been revealed, do not commit illegal sexual intercourse, they would have said, we will never give up illegal sexual intercourse. She goes on to explain that the first verses revealed were about the day of judgment and about Allah. What is our mother Aisha radiallahu anha talking about here? She is diagnosing in her wisdom why we have so many Muslims today saying we will never leave alcoholic drinks, we will never give up illegal sexual intercourse, we will never give up smoking hookah or pot or pornography, we will never give up dating and all the so-called pleasures associated with it. We refuse to give up these things because we have not yet understood the heart of Islam. For years, we've been bombarded by the Haram police, but never have we been exposed to the heart police. The Prophet ﷺ taught us why we end up falling into this type of corruption, why we fall into these types of sins, which we insist upon. He says, in the body, there is a lump of flesh, and if that lump of flesh is set right, then the entire body is set right. And if that lump of flesh is corrupted, then the entire body is corrupted. And verily, 
It is the heart. 